When I finished my last video about this manuscript, I thought the story finished there, but it hadn't. And now I have to add another incredible dimension to the story I've been telling. I never imagined that there had been an eyewitness to the Admiral's very last days, somebody who had been there with him on the train, traveling in the freight car on the way to Auschwitz. An eyewitness who lived to tell the tale, but I found out that there was. On Saturday, October the 16th, 1943, the SS had gone through Rome, rounding up over a thousand Jews from all walks of life, rich people, poor people, housewives, pregnant women, babies, children, handicapped people, young men, old men, and the Admiral had been rounded up too, and he was among them. Only 16 of the thousand ever came back to tell the tale. 15 men and one woman. And one of the men was the eyewitness. He had traveled with the Admiral in the same sealed cattle car of the freight train on his way to Poland. His name was Arminio Waxberger, and I'll get to his story in a moment. Going back to the Admiral, sitting in his room at his typewriter, typing his last entry to his diary, I can now tell you more of what happened next. You see, after I finished my last video, while I was searching the internet for any more chance information about Admiral Capon, I came across a podcast. These days, everybody does podcasts on everything. But this one was from the Sole 24 Ore, which is the Italian Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, if you will. It was a 2023 podcast commemorating the 80th anniversary of that 16th of October in 1943. And it is only now, since I finished the last video about the Admiral's manuscript, that I came to realize that for Italians, and especially for the people of Rome, that Saturday, October the 16th, 1943, is such an infamous day. An Italian friend of mine, after he'd seen the video, and said as soon as he had heard the date of the last entry of the Admiral's diary, he knew exactly what had happened. October the 16th, 1943, was Rome's September the 11th. I, in my foreigner's ignorance, didn't know that. There have been entire books written about that day, such as this book, A Sabado Nero, The Black Saturday the Black Sabbath in English. It was published by uh, an American historian, Robert Katz, in 1969, just 26 years after the events. He drew from contemporary German and Italian sources to tell an in-depth story of the lead up to October the 16th and follows the story to its tragic end in Auschwitz. It's a very powerful, illuminating and horrifying book. It's very readable and very well worth reading. I'll leave uh, details in the comments. October the 16th is still commemorated every year in Rome. And so this podcast, as part of the commemoration last year, was entitled The Raid, Five Stories from the Ghetto of Rome. The story of that dawn of October the 16th, 1943, when the Nazis surrounded the ghetto and rounded up 1,024 Jews throughout Rome. The series was curated by the journalist Elisabetta Fiorito and aired on the newspaper's radio station, Radio 24. But you can imagine my surprise when I saw that the fourth episode was dedicated to our Admiral Augusto Capon. 
And I was even more stunned when I heard her interviewing the Admiral's 82-year-old grandson, Giorgio Capone. And I heard his clear voice telling the story of his grandfather, Il mio nonno, as he describes the Admiral, my grandpa. I was very much affected hearing Giorgio Capone call the Admiral, my Admiral, Il mio nonno. I felt I was touching history. I had fallen through the looking glass. My Admiral had come alive. He was a real person with real relatives. So I contacted the journalist, Elisabetta Fiorito, and sent her the video of my talk about the manuscript and asked her if she would put me in touch with Giorgio Capone. And she did very willingly. And he wrote to me, inviting me to come and see him in Rome. You can imagine my excitement. He still lives in the same house the Admiral built in the early 1900s. It's in an elegant neighborhood just around the corner from Villa Torlonia, where Mussolini lived. Giorgio Capone and his wife and daughter greeted me at the door, gave me a cup of coffee, and uh, made me feel at home. And I found that the Admiral's grandson was a very gentle and kindly man. He's a physicist like his uncle, Enrico Fermi. He's retired now, of course. So we had a quiet chat for over an hour and a half. He told me he had two copies of the manuscript himself, and he brought them out. They were clean copies and not covered in handwritten corrections and additions like my copy has. So I imagine that my copy was probably the Admiral's original and at some point these other copies were made from them. Uh, some time ago Giorgio had the manuscript uh, scanned and printed in a limited edition for his family. But going back to that October in 1943 he told me that in spite of being warned his grandfather decided that morning not to listen to the people telling him to flee. So I asked him if it was known what happened that day. He, of course, was only a two-year-old boy at the time and was living just outside Rome with his family. His father was the Admiral's only son. Uh, I took some notes of what Giorgio Capone said. So it's the morning of October the 16th. 1943. He said, two SS arrived. They had the address, this address, and my grandpa was here with his sister and a maid. He had been warned by friends and relatives to hide and to take care, but he had said, no, they won't take me. He felt secure in his status as a military man. He had his uniform. It's never been really clear, but it's thought he had a letter from Mussolini. Here in this house, there was an, an internal staircase to the upper floor. So his sister went upstairs and he calmly stayed below and waited. When the SS came, they didn't seem to be particularly interested in searching for other people. So they only took him away. And so his sister was saved. And so that was the story of what happened after the Admiral had finished typing his last entry into his diary on that Saturday. Giorgio Capone uh, then uh, brought out a box of old family photographs and showed me some wonderful portraits of, of the Admiral. It was a really uh, a wonderful meeting. But the eyewitness to what happened next was Arminio Waxberger. Arminio Waxberger's children had put together a transcript of the interviews he gave in 1998 to the USC Shoah Foundation, founded by Steven Spielberg at the University of Southern California after he made the film Schindler's List. The book is called L'Interprete the interpreter. 
Unfortunately, the book is only in Italian. In October 1943, Arminio Waxberger was on the eve of his 30th birthday. He was the son of a Polish rabbi and his mother was Hungarian. He was born in present-day Croatia and in the family they spoke many languages, a fact that would save his life. His family became Italian citizens after the First World War and Antonio's father, the rabbi, enrolled in the fascist party as most people found it convenient to do and when Armenio had to do his military service, he worked as a translator with the Air Force in Rome. After his military service, he stayed in Rome, married, worked in a opticians and camera shop. They had a little daughter and he lived along the Tiber uh, opposite the old ghetto and opposite the synagogue. I've made a, a free translation of some of the pertinent passages in the book, and I have to say that I've uh, received permission from the publisher, all around editions, uh, to use these extracts. So let me uh, tell the story as Arminio Wachsberger saw it. So it's Saturday. October the 16th, 1943. The man living in the apartment opposite me was also Jewish, a Mr. Sorani of the Desalem, the delegation for the assistance of Jewish emigrants. He fled just before the SS arrived. He had tried to convince other Jews to flee as well, but he didn't have much success. He knew what was happening to Jews in other countries. Unfortunately, he didn't warn me. At five in the morning, the doorbell rang and rang insistently. Two SS were at the door, with a piece of paper written in German and Italian. You and your family will be transferred to a work camp in Germany. Take enough food for eight days and any of your valuables, because we don't want to have to keep you. You have to do it yourselves. I noticed with amazement as soon as they came into the apartment, the SS cut the telephone line. We had 20 minutes to prepare a suitcase and we could each take one. The SS were brutal and impatient because nobody could understand what they were saying. So I immediately told them I spoke German and would translate. This calmed things down. Once we had our things they forced us to get onto a lorry covered with a tarpaulin, which was waiting for us in the yard. We were the first to get in. The lorries gathered at the Collegio Militare, less than a kilometre from the Vatican. There they made us all get out. Everybody was scared and confused. Most of the people were women, children and old people. A lot of the young people had left Rome a few days before to escape being rounded up for forced labour. I went over to the man who seemed to be the commander of the operation, a Captain Theo Danica, and once again offered to translate for him, which he accepted. Over 1,250 people stayed in the Collegio Militare for the next two days, sleeping on the ground. Over 200 people that were not in the SS list and who were identified as non-Jews or had been rounded up by mistake were let go. Armenia, Armenio Waxberger did all the translating for uh, Danica and he was able to convince him that some of the Jews with Italian sounding names weren't in fact Jews and so they were saved. One woman even gave birth to a baby in the state at the Collegio. Uh, two days later, before dawn on October the 18th, Monday morning, they had to get into the same black lorries and were driven through Rome, which was completely empty and quiet because of the curfew. And they were taken to the train station at Tiburtina, but not the passenger station, but rather the freight station, where a long rusty train 
of cattle cars was waiting for them. The idea of getting inside these cattle cars was both disgusting and humiliating. The sliding doors were open and inside you could see it was totally dark. The SS forced the people onto the wagons, cramming them and jamming them inside, and when the wagon was filled to bursting, they slid the door shut and closed it with an iron bar, which locked them from the outside. I remained on the platform until the end, because I had to translate the orders, and then I got onto the last wagon with my family. As this wagon was the last, there were only about 40 of us left, whereas I'd guess the other wagons had maybe 100 or 120 people in them. These were wagons for horses, and they normally held eight horses in each one. At least this time we were lucky. We all had a suitcase each. In my wagon there was the Admiral Capon, the decorated First World War hero. He was paralyzed from the waist down and moved with the help of two crutches. On the 16th of October he had tried to give the SS commander a letter from Mussolini in which it was clearly written that the Duce congratulated him for his military service. But the commander snapped back, For me, you're just a Jew, and kept him with the other prisoners. In our wagon, there was also the 70-year-old Elena Cavalieri, who had worked with the Red Cross. The Admiral Capon and Elena Cavalieri were very depressed, and kept saying, They are taking us to our deaths. I interrupted them, telling them, why do you say that? They are taking us to a work camp. But Alina Cavalieri, in her work with the Red Cross, had repeatedly heard of the extermination of the Jews in Germany. And Admiral Capon said he had known the Germans and the Austrians all too well in the First World War. Neither of them had any doubts. They were certain we would be killed. At a certain point, Alina Cavalieri pointed to me and said, We will all be killed, but you will be safe, because you know German, and so they need you. The train pulled out at two in the afternoon. We set up a sort of a tent with a blanket and found a bucket to use as a toilet. But it was a very humiliating and embarrassing situation, because the blanket would move with every shake of the train. The temperature inside the cattle car in the afternoon, along with the heat of our bodies, made the air unbreathable. At night time the opposite was true, and it became freezing cold, and we tried to warm ourselves, uh, bunching up together. The train didn't stop until we got to Padua. By now our throats were parched dry, and we all were very thirsty. We cried out, begging for water but the guards pretended not to hear us. Italian fascist militiamen came over, surprised by the indifference of the guards. They asked the SS to open the wagons and let us slake our thirst, but they refused, stone-faced, and only replied, Juden, Jews. But then the militia pointed their machine guns at the SS and said, Juden or not Juden, they are people and we order you to give them something to drink, otherwise we'll shoot you. At that point, the Germans were forced to open up the doors. From each wagon, a few prisoners were allowed to get out with a bucket or a bottle to fill with water for everybody in the wagon. The journey continued. In those days, a German lady who was 90 years old died in our wagon, and we were forced to live beside her dead body for the rest of the journey. In the long train there were many children, and in the beginning they were continually crying out of fear and hunger. But with the passage of time they stopped crying. Two days later, on the 20th of October, the train finally reached the Brenner Pass in the Alps and stopped at the frontier. The Italian personnel of the train were substituted by Germans. The cattle cars were opened. We were now exhausted. We were without strength, couldn't move, cold to our bones because our clothes weren't adapted to the altitude. 
An officer went into each wagon and very carefully counted off the prisoners, telling the total to another German who wrote it down. I noticed that while he was counting out loud, he used the word Stücke, which means pieces or items. There's 40 of them. Stücke. I was shocked by him using this word. I realized that we were no longer people. The evening of the third day, the convoy stopped in Fürth im Wald in Bavaria. Certain Red Cross nurses brought us barley broth. We were all in a pitiful state. Several times I tried to ask them, where are they taking us? Where are they taking us? But they never gave me an answer. They served the broth in silence, once in a while giving a forced smile. Then the train started off again. I started to believe less and less in the story of a work camp. Admiral Capon and Mrs. Cavaliere told me that according to the BBC, that both of them had been listening to back in Rome, the Nazis were carrying out a program of exterminating the Jews in Poland. So they began to think that that was where we were headed. Admiral Capon found a piece of paper and wrote his will and asked me to get in touch with his son-in-law, Enrico Fermi, after the war. He wanted him to know how he had died. But in spite of this, we all hoped that we were wrong. The train crossed Bohemia and Moravia, and we crossed into Poland and stopped at a small station. The wagons were finally open. We, we were made to get out. I saw a sign in German that indicated a toilet for Russian prisoners of war. We were told to use it, and we tried as best as we could to clean up our wagons, even though we were told we couldn't move the people who had died, which by now were quite a few. Seven people are known to have died on the journey. The train moved on a few hours later. By now, we were as weak as newborn kittens. Hope, the last thing to die, was evaporating. The train continued in silence. The evening of Friday, October the 22nd, the convoy stopped. We thought we had arrived at our destination, but we weren't certain. There was an eerie silence. We could hear dogs barking the sound of some late-night train passing in the distance. We saw through the tiny window slots bright lights and a red glow in the sky. We smelt a strangely sweet smell, as though something unusual was, was being burnt. We remained in the train the whole night and tried to sleep. A bit before dawn, Saturday morning, October the 23rd, I woke up and I looked out of the small window which was closed with barbed wire and I saw balloons in the sky. They were anti-aircraft balloons anchored with cables bobbing above some factories. In the meantime, my five-year-old daughter Claretta was waking up. I picked her up and took her to the window to show her the balloons. At the same time, an SS officer was approaching and when he saw my daughter, he picked up a stone and threw it at the window. It didn't hit her because of the barbed wire. But at that moment, I realized we had arrived at the gates of hell. The SS immediately started yelling out orders in German, and we had to get out, everybody stumbling over each other, blinded by the violent light. There were soldiers everywhere, yelling and giving orders. Then men wearing striped uniforms went into the wagons without saying a word and took all our suitcases. We tried to stop them, but they whispered to us that we would get them later, speaking to us in German. They were unbelievably thin. On their worn out uniforms, two triangles of material were stitched to form a Star of David. I tried speaking to them in all the, language I, in all the languages I knew in German, in French, in English, in Yiddish, even in Hungarian. I asked them, what's happening? Where are we? But they didn't answer and quickly carried away our things. Finally, one of them, with an F sewed above his star, indicating, as I learned later, that he was from France, whispered back, I can't talk to you, 
but if they ask how old you are, say you're under 30. I wonder what he meant. As we were lining up on the station platform of this infamous camp that I came to know was called Auschwitz-Birkenau, two men arrived. Rudolf Hess, who I immediately learned was the commander-in-chief, and Josef Mengele, the head doctor, accompanied by other officers. They asked who could interpret for them, and I was pushed to the front. Exactly as ha had happened a week earlier, at the Collegio Militare, I was asked to climb onto a table and start translating their orders. As soon as everybody saw me, they quietened down, waiting to hear what I said. They asked me to tell the people that we had arrived at the work camp, where the men and women who were healthy would do the work they were used to doing, whereas the elderly, the weak, the pregnant women and the children will be taken to a camp nearby where they can either rest or do lighter work. There was no reason to worry because our families would be reunited this same evening. In the meantime, we had to shower and be disinfected. The men and women who were going to do heavier work had to walk over to the barracks and the main work camp where the showers were. The elderly, the weak, the pregnant women and the children would be driven over by lorry to the showers in the rest camp so they wouldn't get too tired. At this point, Dr. Mengele asked me to get down from the table and stay beside him. He told me as the medical director of the camp, he would start to select the people who were fit for work. Everybody had to pass in front of him, so he could divide them into two groups. One group had to get onto the lorries, and the others had to wait on the platform. Women were separated from the men. The selection started immediately. Young men and women on one side, and the handicapped, the elderly, and the women with children on the other. This group was loaded onto lorries with the Red Cross symbol on the side. Some men finished among the elderly only because their seven-day-old beards made them seem older. In the end, 600 people finished on the lorries, and 450 of us about, the young and healthy, were left standing in front of him. At this point, Dr. Mengele said, the work camp is 10 kilometers from here. Anybody who is tired or doesn't feel up to the work, you can join the others on the lorries. Everybody else will start walking. About 250 people accepted the offer and went towards the lorries. While the others, even if they were tired out by the journey and the situation, didn't completely believe the reassurances of the Nazis and decided to stay. As I thought I had finished my job as interpreter, exhausted as I was, I made to go and join my wife and daughter on one of the lorries. But Commandant Hurst and Dr. Mengele called out to me, Dolmetscher, interpreter, where are you going? I'm going to join my family, I said. No, 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 your work isn't finished. You'll join your family this evening in the rest camp. So I joined the others on the march to the camp. We marched in two columns, men on one side and women on the other. All told, there were 154 men and 47 women. After a few hundred meters, we arrived at the camp. I thought to myself, but they had told us the camp was 10 kilometers away. But I had no time to overthink it. I only realized the significance later. All told, 826 Jews who were taken away by lorry were taken directly to the gas chambers and killed that day. And that included the family of Arminio Waxberger and also Admiral Capon. So that is how Admiral Augusto Capon lived the last week of his life. Arminio Waxberger survived a series of concentration camps working as a translator and two weeks after being liberated he married another concentration camp survivor. He died in 2002. They had two daughters who were the ones who collected the interviews for this book. Many things that Arminio recounts are corroborated by others. We are all perhaps familiar, all too familiar with Holocaust stories. 
but I thought that this particular one deserved retelling. If Augusto Capon's life were made into a play, I think it would be a Greek tragedy. I have been going down this rabbit hole, as people say now, of the life of Admiral Capon, and I have found many other interesting things which merit telling, and I hope to make other videos about them, also concerning the memoirs. With that, I finish this video. May the Admiral rest in peace. Thank you for watching.